It's a real privilege to have the chance to give this talk, um, and, a, and a real honor. I've um, been a member of this department for uh, 10 years now, and uh, I feel really privileged to be part of this department. So I'm so grateful for the uh, support that I've received in, in doing the work that I do uh, with many graduate students, excellent graduate students and colleagues I get to work with. Um, and, and really, the, the, the confidence that's been shown to let me do the kind of work that I'm going to be presenting to you today. Um, but I suppose after 10 years, it's about time that I give some account of what I do with my day. So I'm happy to have the chance uh, to, to give this talk. Um, what I have tried to do with this talk, as Mark said, it's the first chance for me to, to give uh, an overview of, of this. Uh, this is the proposal for the seven-year uh, partnership grant funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Uh, it is thicker than my doctoral dissertation. Um, and today is an opportunity for me to try and take the objectives of the project and situate it within the debates uh, of, of political science and international relations to frame it within the context of the challenge of uh, collective action, particularly in this time of populism, and really to bring some questions to all of you uh, to get your feedback and your thoughts on how we begin uh, this, uh, this, this seven-year uh, seven journey together. But what I really tried to do is answer a question that I've heard uh, Professor Gopika Solanki ask in uh, two hiring committees that we've sat on together with, with eight candidates. It's this, it's this laser beam question that terrifies me when I hear her ask it, and she's not asking it to me. And the question is asking a candidate, what important puzzle do you see yourself addressing in the next five to ten years? So given that uh, we've got a seven-year project, it fits within the wheelhouse of five to, seven, uh, five, five to ten years. So I'm going to try and answer that question because for me, the puzzle that preoccupies me is the pursuit of collective action in a world of sovereign states. Uh, specifically for me, how do you ensure international cooperation to realize protection and solutions with or for refugees. But this pursuit of collective action, this need for international cooperation is far from limited to my area of work. If those of you working on issues of climate change, global finance, trade, uh, weapons regimes, there are all kinds of areas where we try and overcome collective action failure. There's the notion that there are these challenges in the international system that go beyond the capacity of any one state to resolve on their own. And it's recognized that we need to work collectively to address these challenges. Now, the movement of people in, in, in need of protection in response to fear of persecution, now it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge that's older than the state system itself, as I'll explain in a moment. And managed well, Refugees find protection, they find solutions, and that benefits not only refugees, but states and the international system more generally. But managed poorly, and the movement of refugees can exacerbate existing problems and create new problems, certainly for refugees, but also for states and the international system more generally. And this challenge seems to be getting harder, not easier to resolve. So the puzzle that preoccupies me is the puzzle of how to imagine or maybe reimagine international cooperation. How can we understand the meaning or the functioning of collective action in a world of diverse sovereign states? How can we mobilize the tools of political science and other academic disciplines to reimagine both the study and the practice of collective action? So where do we begin? For me to start answering this question, I, I turn to the wisdom of someone who has really challenged and inspired me in recent years. That's my six-year-old son, Alan. And it's a moment that really stood out for me last May when, as a family, we visited the Royal Tyrrell Museum uh, in Drumheller, Alberta, the Dinosaur Museum. And while we were in the Royal Tyrrell Museum, we were standing in front of this wall-sized map of the world, kind of like this one. And what the map does is it starts in the Olduvai Gorge in, in East Africa in the Rift Valley, and it shows through these arrows 
how over hundreds of thousands of years people have moved and how it's a consequence of this gradual process of movement and adaptation that we now have people living around the world on every continent permanently except for Antarctica. And my son, Alan, he stood in front of this map and he looked at it and he said, Papa, I said, yes. So does this mean that people have always moved? And I said, well, yes, it means that for hundreds of thousands of years we've moved. That's part of the human story. And he looked at it and he nodded and he said, so what's the big deal about refugees? Now, of course, if only it was so simple. The movement of people and the challenge of refugees matters because we live in a world not just of continents, but of sovereign states. And starting in 1648, we've lived in a world where we privilege state borders and the sovereignty of states. And while borders may be artificial, may be porous, I can tell you my, you know, my, my, my favorite story about the land border between Tanzania and Kenya and the Berlin Conference and Queen Victoria making a gift to her cousin uh, of, of, of Mount Kilimanjaro and how that forever changes borders. If you want that story, I'll tell you later. So while borders may be artificial, while they may be porous, while they may be crossed in so many virtual ways, the organization of the world into a system of sovereign states matters. It's because, it's because of that system, because of a system of sovereign states, that we have refugees. You know, not displacement, not exile, specifically refugees. If we didn't have sovereign states, we would not have this concept of refugee. The word refugee traces its origin to the Huguenots that fled France after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 within a blink of the eye of the establishment of the modern state system in 1648. A refugee is someone who can no longer rely on the protection of their sovereign, of their state, and needs to go to another political community to seek that subsequent, or that, that, uh, that substitute protection. So as a consequence of this sovereign state system, it became much more possible for leaders to decide who belonged in their political community and, and who did not. And this process accelerated through the 18th and 19th centuries in the midst of revolutions and, and nationalism. And refugees became those who fell between the cracks of an international system of states. And this process accelerated in the aftermath of World War I, the Russian Revolution, and World War II. By the end of World War II, there were 55 million people displaced in Europe alone. And in the fragility of a post-war Europe, and in the early days of the Cold War, it was a time where notions of justice had more currency in international affairs. The confluence of all of these factors resulted in a shared commitment on the part of states to cooperate to find a solution for refugees. And what resulted was the establishment of what we now call the global refugee regime. Now, this fits squarely within the study of global regimes. From the early 1980s and the work of Krasner and Kohane and others, we've studied the understanding of, of a regime being this combination of, of norms and institutions and decision-making procedures where we try and overcome collective action failure. The idea that states recognize the benefit of collective action, they create norms to make Predict it, to behave, make behavior more predictable, they create institutions to facilitate cooperation, and they create decision-making mechanisms to address issues as they arise. So classically, this notion of the refugee regime fits within this broader issue of regimes, as we would have with international trade or human rights. And this refugee regime was one of a number of regimes that emerged in that early post-war period, at that time where rules, a rules-based international order was being constructed. The UN General Assembly resolutions in 1949 and 1950 created the institution, 
the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The 1951 convention relating to the status of refugees gave us this universal definition of who is and who is not a refugee, and it also codified the norm of non refoulement the idea that you cannot send back to a country someone who fears persecution in that country. This norm has become so foundational in the functioning of the international system that it seemed to be binding on all states whether or not they've signed the 1951 convention. There was also a decision-making procedure that established in 1958, which is the executive committee of the High Commissioner's program, a group of states that were intended to meet to give advice to the High Commissioner to address new issues as they arose. Great! We have a regime. If only it was as easy as that. The global refugee regime was established to do two core things. Number one, ensure protection for refugees. Number two, find a solution to their plight. But by any objective measure, it is not able to predictably deliver on these two functions. A cursory view of the headlines, whether it's the Daily Star of Lebanon or the New York Times, you see that refugees in the global north and the global south face a very precarious journey in trying to access protection. And as for solutions, the average duration of a refugee situation today is 20 years. So by any objective measure, the refugee regime is not able to do what it was established to do. It faces challenges of compliance and challenges of enforcement, as do so many global regimes. So why is this? You know, why do we have a regime that's manifestly unable to do what states themselves created it to do? Now, there are many explanations, but one is a question of design. There were many competing visions of what this regime would look like and what the mandate of this organization would be. One vision was from states like India and Pakistan, who had very recently gone through the process of partition. India and Pakistan, having come through the process of the creation of new states in a post-colonial world, and having experienced the displacement of some 10 million people as a result of partition, argued that the refugee regime needed to be global in scope, tools to be able to engage with the fundamental political causes of displacement, issues of citizenship and belonging, and that it needed to have a robust, independent personality. It needed to be independently funded. It could not be reliant on the whims of other states, of states. Now, the other vision was promoted by the United States and its allies. And in the early days of the Cold War, for the United States, refugees were simply too valuable a foreign policy tool to relinquish control to an autonomous and independent UN agency. And so the United States argued for a UN agency that would be limited in its capacity, would be reliant on states, was precluded from addressing the political causes of displacement, and had a very limited temporal mandate, and was reliant on voluntary funds. So the UNHCR and the refugee regime that we have today is very much the product of this second vision. It's one of these clear examples of institutional power on the part of the United States to be able to create an international organization that reflected, yes, its values, but its vision of how the issue fit into the world. And there, were very two, there are two very important ways that UNHCR's mandate has been and continues to be constrained by these decisions at its moment of inception. Paragraph one of UNHCR's core mandate, I'll give you a second to read that, Test your eyesight in the back row. So here we have this paragraph which still today encapsulates the core mandate of UNHCR to provide international protection and to seek permanent solutions. But UNHCR was not empowered to do this on its own. It acts under the authority of the General Assembly, which of course is made up of states, UNHCR takes its direction from the General Assembly and the politics of that body. And of course, this has resulted in changes of UNHCR as the composition of the General Assembly itself has changed. 
But fundamentally, UNHCR cannot change its activities without the benediction of the General Assembly and states. But more critically, when you look at what UNHCR is mandated to do to ensure, uh, to, to provide protection and ensure solutions, it doesn't do it on its own. It assists governments. And with the permission of governments, it can work with private organizations, but governments remain the gatekeeper in ensuring solutions for refugees. UNHCR has identified some 1.4 million refugees in the world today that are in need of resettlement to a third country to find a solution. But it's reliant on states offering places for UNHCR to then fill. And with recent changes in the United States, the number of places available for refugee resettlement this year will be somewhere in the area of 60,000. There's a massive gap between 1.4 million and 60,000. But here is the much more fundamental way where states have retained control over the functioning of UNHCR. Paragraph 20 of UNHCR statute talks about funding. And it sounds like good news. Have a quick read. So it starts off and it says, good news. The office will be funded under the budget of the United Nations. Great! But, unless we decide otherwise that no expenditure other than the administrative expenditures relating to the function of the Office of the High Commissioner will be borne by the budget of the United Nations, everything else will come from voluntary contributions. What does this mean? UNHCR has annual expenditures now of close to $4 billion. Only 3% comes from the UN's budget. And that's to pay the High Commissioner's salary, his driver, flights to New York, his telephone line, an administrative assistant. 97% of UNHCR's funding comes from voluntary contributions. And it really matters who gives that money. As a matter of policy, since the late 1980s, the United States, up until this fiscal year, the United States has committed to providing more than one-third of UNHCR's funding for the very simple reason that that gives the United States incredible clout, material power over the functioning of UNHCR to the extent that the Deputy High Commissioner is an American in recognition of the fact that the United States is the single largest donor to UNHCR. But then when you look at the, the other countries that are large donors, these are the countries of the global north who have pursued an agenda of containing refugees within the global south. So, yes, these donors give a great deal, you know, the 85% the of refugees remain in the global south, 85% of the money comes from the global north, but there's also the question of earmarking. This graph goes up to 2009, because if we kept going, the story would just be too depressing. But what you see on this graph is that more than half of all money given to UNHCR is tightly earmarked. Now, tightly earmarked gives means here's funding for education programs in the Dadaab refugee camp in Kenya. Broadly earmarked means here's money for your operations in the Middle East and North Africa. Only 18% of funding to UNHCR, and I think last year it was sort of in the area of 15% of funding to UNHCR, is unearmarked. That means UNHCR only has discretion of how it, fund, how it uses 15% of the money it receives. And what that means is if there is something that donors do not like, if there's something that UNHCR proposes to do, donors simply refuse to give money to UNHCR to implement that program. This has real consequences for the principle and practice of collective action. The preamble to the 1951 convention recognizes that the granting of asylum may place burdens or may result in costs for certain countries. And so if we're going to solve this problem, we cannot resolve it without international cooperation. 
It's recognized. It's, it's, it's been repeated in the last 50 years. There have been more than 35 UN General Assembly resolutions that have recognized the need for international cooperation. But to this day, there is no binding obligation on states to cooperate. Any contribution to the refugee regime is discretionary. While there's a recognition that everyone must cooperate, there's no binding obligation on any particular state at any particular time to cooperate. This is notwithstanding the fact that countries of first asylum, countries that first receive refugees, when Uganda received 800,000 refugees from South Sudan two years ago, Uganda had an obligation to grant at minimum temporary protection. But when Uganda appealed to the world to say, we need this funding, to help respond to the arrival of 800,000 refugees, it only received about 20% of the funds it requested. because There is no obligation on other states to cooperate with Uganda. What this has meant is that we have a very particular political geography of where we find refugees in the world. What we find is that the vast majority of the world's refugees, 85% of the world's refugees, remain in the global south. Just six countries in the world, uh, just 10 countries in the world today, host 60% of the world's refugees. Countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan, Lebanon, Jordan, Kenya, Tanzania, Chad, and uh, the Central African Republic. Right? What we find is that refugees cross borders into their immediate neighbors. And in the absence of an international obligation to other states to cooperate, it means that we are able, we, that what we witness is the containment of refugees within their region of origin. Now, this situation came to a head in 2015, especially as a result of uh, four years of the containment of refugees in Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey as a result of the lack of cooperation and in the absence of a pathway to solutions, what we saw was nearly uh, a million individuals, refugees and others, moving from within this region of origin uh, through Turkey into Greece and into the European Union. What resulted in 2015 was not a refugee crisis. What resulted in 2015 was a crisis of international cooperation. It was the clearest manifestation of the limitations of the refugee regime. I said that the refugee regime is an example of cooperation like climate change, but the big difference between refugees and carbon emissions is that refugees have agency. And there can reach a point where refugees perceive a lack of options and begin to take matters in their own hands and demonstrate agency to pursue their own solutions. And as a result of what happened in 2015, there was a recognition that the refugee regime was in need of resuscitation. And the response was quite encouraging. In November 2015, there was a special session of the UN General Assembly. In April 2016, there was a report of the UN Secretary General mapping out areas of reform, a dramatic increase in refugee resettlement, more binding obligations around international cooperation. On the 19th of September 2016, there was a UN summit. That summit started a two-year clock for states to develop two compacts. One, a global compact on refugees, and second, a global compact on safe, orderly, and regular migration. If you have questions about the compact on migration, ask Nathan, don't ask me. On the 20th of September, and this is important, on the 20th of September, there was a follow-up summit. And it was hosted by President Obama. It was called the Leader Summit. And what President Obama did in the waning, uh, uh, waning stages of his presidency, there was a recognition that the United States could use its authority, could use its, 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 its material power, could use its institutional power, could use its structural power, to begin a new process to reward those states that were willing to make new contributions to cooperation or new, co new contributions to solutions. Countries like Jordan, countries like Ethiopia, and I'll talk about in a moment. So in the midst of a process to develop these two new compacts, 
The hegemon of the refugee regime, that state that contributes more than any other country, use that position to begin a conversation of very practical and applied responses. And what we saw in this two-year process is that there was a, a policy discussion about what this new global compact should include, and an empirical discussion of the results of pilot studies through the Comprehensive Refugee Response Framework. And after two years, we had two new compacts. The Global Compact on Migration, adopted by states in Marrakesh on the 10th of December. And then, on the 17th of December, 2018, the Global Compact on Refugees was adopted by the UN General Assembly. Hooray! So what does this piece of paper give us that we didn't have before? It's premised around the objectives of easing pressures on refugee hosting states and communities, enhancing self-reliance for refugees, expanding access to third country solutions, supporting conditions in country of origin to return. What it says is that it wants to achieve more equitable and predictable burden and responsibility sharing with host countries and communities and to support the search for solutions, but it is not a legally binding document. There is nothing in this that commits states to implement what it says within this document. But it was encouraging to see that over this two-year process that experts and refugees themselves contributed to a reimagining of what might be possible. It was all very technical and it was all very interesting until it became the target of populism. And it took many of us by surprise. The, when, when the process started in 2016, the question was, how can we get the public excited about this process of developing a global compact? By November 2018, it was like, how can we get the public to stop talking about the development of these global compacts? Because although the compact is not legally binding, and while contributions will be determined by each state, populist leaders on the political right began to express concern that the compacts eroded the sovereignty of states to make decisions regarding the admission and the treatment of refugees. It made for a very busy fall, especially and including here in Canada. A motion was brought to the Standing Committee on Citizenship and Immigration on the 30th of October, and I'll read what the motion said. It called on the committee to study the two global compacts, and that this study should ex examine the degree to which Canada was consulted, that the study determines how the compacts will affect Canada, including potential impacts on immigration levels, resettlement cost supports, potential cost impacts on social programs, such as social welfare system, affordable housing, regional homelessness shelters, and food banks, and how it affects the sovereignty of Canada to make decisions regarding immigration policy. It took us all completely by surprise. And Nathan and I and others mobilized to bring testimony to the Standing Committee to explain the non-binding nature, explain the value of collective action, and to defend a rules-based international order. In the end, the motion was defeated and Canada signed on both to the, or, uh, the Compact on Migration and the Compact uh, on Refugees. But what was striking is that similar motions and similar debates led by populist parties on the right took place in Australia, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, France, Germany, Liechtenstein, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Slovakia, Switzerland, following the trail of Steve Bannon's travel. The global compacts became the target of the language, of the narrative, of the talking points of populism. It became a flashpoint in a wider debate of the balance between national interests and collective action, of sovereignty versus cooperation. And these debates were not limited to the global north. In February 2018, President Magafuli of Tanzania, himself employing a, a, a populist playbook, withdrew from a pilot to support Tanzania in implementing the Global Compact on Refugees. Now in the end, the Global Compact was adopted. Test your eyesight find the two black dots. Hungary, who for quite some time 
had argued against the idea of collective action and eroding Hungary's sovereignty, the second vote against the Global Compact was from the United States. At the General Assembly on the 17th of December, 2018, the hegemon of the global refugee regime voted against this effort to plug the gaps. What does that mean? Can international cooperation on refugees be secured without the support of those states who formed and sustained the regime designed to facilitate cooperation? Can agreements like the Global Compact be implemented without the political and the material support of key states like the United States? What does this mean for cooperation? Well, these questions fit directly into debates on implementation. Both the earlier literature from Mervyn Soros and others in the 1980s on global public policy, but more recent discussions within constructivist international relations like implementation and world politics that recognizes that the norm life cycle extends beyond institutionalization. The institutionalization of a norm, the, uh, even a policy norm like the Global Compact, the fact that we have it on a piece of paper doesn't inevitably mean that it will be implemented or that it will be implemented evenly across contexts. They recognize that implementation is a distinct stage in the policy process and the norm life cycle. And they note the frequency of variation in the process of implementation and ask how that variation can be understood and harnessed. Now, my work in recent years has very much been situated within these discussions of global public policy and norm implementation. Uh, at, I, I, I co-organized a conference uh, at, at the Refugee Study Center at Oxford in 2012 on this question of global refugee policy, and, and we had a special issue of the Journal of Refugee Studies two years later that really tried to delineate global refugee policy as a distinct area of activity of the regime. We argue that global refugee policy is a product. We can study the process that uh, went into producing this document. But more generally, global refugee policy is a process itself of how policy is made, the politics of setting the agenda, the politics of decision making, the politics of evaluation. But what has increasingly preoccupied me is the politics of implementation. What factors condition variation in implementation? And how do we understand this often messy and unpredictable process where we take something agreed upon at the global level and implement it in local context? The argument is that if we understand this process of implementation, who are the actors? What are the interests that are involved? It makes for interesting study that contributes to debates within international relations and global public policy, but also might empower us to do a better job of navigating the politics of implementation. And this becomes especially important when we understand the everyday politics of the refugee regime. This notion that once global refugee policy leaves the global level, the decision-making confines of the refugee regime, the very orchestrated pantomime of Geneva, it leaves that safe environment and it goes out into more than 120 different national contexts. And efforts need to be made to implement that policy. Now, what we find is that at a national level, governments play a central role in determining policy on that territory. But once we go from the national level to the local level, we find that the implementation of refugee policy in practice needs to be negotiated with a really wide range of local actors, local police, business owners, and, and other brokers. And that led to, to, to this special issue and, a, and a, a framework piece that I wrote with Kristina Wojnarowicz, who was an MA student in political science at that time, really trying to understand the tools to be able to engage with both expressions and experiences of power at the global, regional, and national level. And this is what really led us to the notion of studying the everyday politics of the global refugee regime is to recognize that the everyday context of advocating for protection and solutions within four refugees brings you into contact with power brokers and actors with their own interests, with their own priorities. Now, 
Within the literature, there's already a difference between working in a refugee camp where humanitarian actors can govern this humanitarian space, as opposed to urban spaces where power brokers may have never heard of UNHCR. Take the case of Kenya. In the case of Kenya, the government of Kenya sets policy. But the way that policy is then implemented in a context like the Dadaab refugee camp, the camp that we saw on the poster for this talk, which is surrounded by barbed wire and where refugees are not allowed to move in and out. That is a highly governed space. Compare that with the neighborhoods of Nairobi, where landlords, shop owners, police, they work by a different set of rules. And even variation between the Eastleigh neighborhood, which is predominantly Somali and has been very well established, compared to the Kibera slum, which is where we find most Congolese refugees, and understanding the variation in everyday politics between the two. Now, why does this matter? Because when we begin to look at everyday politics and the local context of, impl of, of implementation, we start to observe very important changes in practice that have implications for theory. And the greatest shift that we begin to notice is that what constitutes collective action, what constitutes cooperation, goes beyond the traditional interstate practices that have preoccupied the study of the refugee regime. For the first 50 years of the regime, we focused on cooperation, meaning physical and financial burden sharing. Financial burden sharing meaning giving money to a country to defray the cost of hosting refugees. Physical burden sharing meaning the relocation of refugees from a country to another country. Again, take Kenya. Financial burden sharing means paying money so that the Dadaab refugee camp remains open. Physical burden sharing means resettling a portion of Somali refugees to a country like Canada. But what we find in studying the everyday politics of the refugee regime is that the everyday politics reveals, yes, forms of contestation. And the study of everyday politics is classic, you know, Scott's work of weapons of the weak, this idea of foot dragging and resistance, the way that everyday politics reveals these moments of contestation. But studying the everyday also reveals these very surprising moments of cooperation. These moments when we find actors not traditionally associated with the refugee regime cooperating in new ways. Municipalities, mayors, business owners, the private sector, diaspora communities, development actors. They're all engaged in responses to refugee situations, especially because refugees spend an average of 20 years in exile. Already they've moved beyond an emergency phase they begin to approach it within this longer term question of development. And also, what are the forms of cooperation that we see? It's well beyond financial and physical burden sharing. Some of the forms of cooperation that we now see are new trade agreements, either at a state level with the Jordan's, Jordan's new agreement of being able to get preferential access to European markets for goods produced in special economic zones that employ refugees. But in Uganda, the trade routes through uh, Sudan and up to the Mediterranean, the trade agreements that we see moving across borders through the networks of refugees and how that forms part of, 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 of survival skills and, and notions of cooperation, how the meaning of cooperation changes when you get to the local level. An incredible study by Susan Martin at Georgetown that looked right across the Middle East and North Africa and ask state officials, local business owners, refugees themselves, what does international cooperation mean to you? The minority of actors talked about financial and physical burden sharing. The majority of actors talked about business cooperation and economic opportunities. But then critically, why do they cooperate? What are the incentives for these new forms of cooperation? What are the interests that are at play? Very rarely are these entirely or even partially motivated by a normative commitment to the principles of the refugee regime. The interests that govern cooperation in domestic settings and in local settings are often unrelated to the presence of refugees. That's really interesting. And it challenges us to ask new questions. And this is one of the theoretical questions that animates 
this undertaking that is giving me so much gray hair. So we have launched this seven-year collaboration between four Canadian universities, NGO partners, national working groups in Kenya, Tanzania, Lebanon, and Jordan, with an advisory committee that includes Global Affairs Canada, UNHCR, the International Development Research Centre, the Network for Refugee Voices. We're going to undertake four areas of programming in response to needs and priorities that are identified by our national working groups. To undertake collaborative research, to identify and train graduate students to go and work in partnership with our national working group to answer questions that relate to the implementation of global policy in national contexts. Our first two postings to Kenya uh, have, have been uh, posted on carlton.ca backslash learn, L-E-R-R-N, for those who are listening at home. And postings for Tanzania, Lebanon, and Jordan will be uh, available within the next two weeks. We'll be offering training for Canadian graduate students going abroad to do this research, but also for communities of practice in East Africa and the Middle East. Last week I was in Lebanon and Jordan, and for them the greatest contribution that we can make is in the running of summer courses. In August 2019 we'll be running a summer course in Kenya, including participants from Kenya and Tanzania, but also Lebanon and Jordan to be able to empower emerging scholars and uh, uh, representatives of national NGOs, journalists and bureaucrats, not only to broaden their understanding of refugee issues, but also to create these communities of practice, to have that rainbows and tambourine moment where you're working together and you're sharing experience across contexts. And the idea of then replicating this with a regional workshop, uh, a reg regional summer course in the Middle East starting in 2020 and in Kenya continuing on from there. And then a lot of activities around knowledge translation and mobilization. I can get into more of this in the Q&A. But again, I'll warn you, that was the proposal. So if you start asking me questions about what we're doing, you've got to get ready for that. But what's so interesting for me, so in, in October I was in Kenya and Tanzania, two countries I know really, really well. I've been affiliated with the Center for the Study of Forced Migration at the University of Dar es Salaam in Tanzania since 1999. So these are situations that I know really well in terms of the granularity of the everyday politics. That's really informed, those are the empirical contexts that have really informed my theorization. So my first visit ever to Lebanon and Jordan last week. You know the saying, same, same, but different. It was amazing how where there's obvious specificity within each situation, this notion of everyday politics, this notion of local actors and interests that produce different forms of cooperation, it was as vibrant and as evident in Lebanon and Jordan as it was in Kenya and Tanzania. So very quickly, you know, this, these are the kinds of questions that we're going to ask. So in Kenya, you have a national policy in Nairobi that where the government of Kenya has tried to close the Dadaab refugee camps and force refugees back into Somalia. But at the same time as there's a national narrative of being highly restrictive, you find that outside of the Kakuma refugee camp in Turkana, up in the northwest, that the local governor, with the support of the World Bank, is, is, is deploying a whole new model of the Ketembe settlement, where you have refugees and, and local Turkana Kenyan citizens so working side by side and creating a new economy with a parallel currency. The World Bank conducted a survey of the economy in the Turkana state, and they found that the presence of refugees added over $58 million a year to the local economy. And so how that has created a new incentive structure and now come to change the way the regime, the government, the state in Nairobi perceives refugees as a burden or as an opportunity. In Tanzania, where you have President Magafuli trying to push back against his predecessor, President Kikwete's decision to naturalize 162,000 Burundian refugees who had been in Katumba, Mishombo, and Ulukulu since 1972, and trying to implement this populist regime of Hapa Tanzania, not accepting an imposition of policy frameworks on Tanzania by external actors. But then going to Kigoma, the port town of Kigoma, you realize that local actors there and merchants, that they realize that the movement of refugees from Burundi and from the DRC, the availability of cheap labor, the economy that's created by these massive refugee assistance programs, the employment opportunities for guards and drivers and cleaners, 
take refugees out of the local economy, the economy of Kigoma suffers. And what you see is this extraordinary variation again between the national narrative and the local narrative. Now, this begins to accelerate even in a country like Jordan, with one of the most civil society environments that I've encountered. You know, a very uh, centralized and effective state in Amman that has been able to use the presence not just of Syrian refugees, but Iraqi refugees, Palestinian refugees, generations of refugees as part of its rent-seeking behavior vis-a-vis -vis Western states. With the position of Jordan between Israel, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, the stability of Jordan and its ability to use its uh, delivery of what it calls a, a public good, a global public good of hosting refugees, has extracted trade concessions from the European Union. But to see how that works in areas on the outskirt of Amman, where there is a business elite with a clear sense of interest, versus how that works on the border, where the economic opportunities are coupled by the insecurity of the spillover of the conflict in Syria, you find there that the national government is portraying a very active, uh, progressive uh, external policy. But it's finding it hard to sustain that policy, given resistance from local actors, but also in the midst of externally imposed austerity measures. Rise in the price of bread, cuts in subsidy to fuel, and this notion of how the actions of the IMF in Jordan constrain the space within which progressive refugee policies can be pursued. And then there's Lebanon. You just read the Daily Star from Lebanon and you see how the politics of refugees, relations with Syria, are deeply woven and seen through the confessionalist framework of politics in Lebanon how the, uh, you know, the, the, the Shia parties who have aligned themselves with Hezbollah supporting the regime within Damascus, how the approach to refugees and the hosting of refugees, the reception that refugees receive in southern Lebanon in Hezbollah-controlled territory is very different from what we see in, in the Baqa or what we see uh, up in regions that are predominantly uh, Sunni, that where the, uh, there's a shared ethnicity between the uh, predominant uh, uh, demographic of the refugees and the host community, where the whole history of the relationship, Syria's uh, 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 involvement in Lebanon from 1990 to 2005, to try and disentangle all of this, but then also to try and disentangle the difference between Palestinian refugees, Palestinian refugees who were in Syria who fled to Lebanon, of Syrian refugees. You recognize that, and, and, and couple that with the fact that for much of the Syrian refugee presence since 2011, from what, 2013 to 2016, there was no functioning central government in Lebanon. And so all decisions were then downloaded onto local municipalities. How can you understand the implementation of global refugee policy in Lebanon without understanding everyday politics? But here's my penultimate slide. This is where I want to leave you. It's not just using the tools of everyday politics to understand how we go about pursuing protection with and for refugees. That's one of the objectives of LEARN is to develop these tools of political analysis to be able to empower civil society actors in each of these countries to enhance the way they navigate everyday politics. But it raises these questions, as I said, of, of who cooperates, what form cooperation takes, and why they do that makes you realize that when we talk about collective action, when we study collective action, when we theorize on collective action, Yes, we need to focus on the action of states, but we also need to understand how there are forms of cooperation within and between national governments. There's collective action between a range of new sub-state and non-state actors. This isn't exclusive to refugees. If you look at the way that state and municipal authorities in the United States are engaging with issues of climate change, independent of the policy position of the uh, government in Washington, D.C., you see that this is not unique to refugees. But what we do find is that there are these new forms of cooperation that haven't traditionally been captured by the study of cooperation on refugees. But this is what's really exciting me now, is the notion of how 
a more nuanced understanding of who cooperates, in what way, and why, adds to this understanding of what constructs the wind sets that motivate states to act in a particular way. Those who have studied Putnam's a notion of the two-level games, this notion that when a state is negotiating externally, they're constrained or empowered by the wind sets they have at home. And this is where I think there's real room for theorizing on new understandings of cooperation. The actors that influence the wind sets that determine the behavior of states in international negotiations are much more nuanced and are much more varied than certainly we have understood within refugee studies. Now, as I said in the, in the, in, in the, in the, in the abstract for this talk, I think this raises questions, certainly for my field of cooperation and refugees, but I want to hear from all of you. How does it affect cooperation in issues of defense? How does it affect cooperation in issues of global finance? Do we see the same kind of proliferation of actors, issue linkages that change wind sets, that change the behavior of states? And in a practical way, we can ask questions of how civil society, how local actors can engage with this new congregation of actors to influence wind sets to motivate and to sustain new forms of collective action. But ultimately, what does this mean for the way we study this core question of international cooperation? Thank you.